I'd like to take you back in time to the 1980s. I remember it well. <laughs> that was a joke. In the 1980s, gang violence in Los Angeles was reaching record highs. The police and the government had little recourse to address previously unheard of flagrant acts of violence in broad daylight. Around this time, a Jesuit priest named Greg Boyle was assigned to the parish at the center of it all. Instead of sitting in his office all day, Boyle felt the call to roam the community and meet the gang members who, in his eyes, were not violent and evil, but lost and unsupported. He would ride around on his bike brokering peace treaties among rival gangs. Soon, he formalized his work and founded an organization called Homeboy Industries. It has grown in its 32 years of operation to become the largest gang intervention and rehabilitation program in the world. Each year, Father Greg, or G-Dog as he's known to the homies, opens his door to over 10,000 former gang members, finding them jobs, providing tattoo removal services, and offering them the compassionate home of belonging that most have never experienced. Father Greg has written several books over the years, and last month, his newest one hit the shelves. It's called Cherished Belonging. Father Greg begins by writing that his reason for doing so is the division of our current time and his yearning to realize God's design for humanity to live in community together. In his introduction, he writes these words, quote, normalization and polarization have both proven corrosive to kinship. Kinship being the theology of each of us being called by God to live in harmony together as one Christian family. The book's thesis rests upon two key principles. Number one, everyone is unshakably good, no exceptions. And number two, we belong to each other, no exceptions. Though perhaps unintentional, Father Greg's book has arrived at a perfect time in my view. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but we had a pretty big national election in this country a few weeks ago. I've since been reflecting on it, not on the candidates and the results, but rather a different kind of tragic outcome from all of it. This past month has yielded, at least for me, a revelation of a rupturing. I've been so disheartened by our nation's division. Many of us have probably sensed that our country has seemed to be drifting apart for some time, but it seems, at least to me, that this election has accelerated that to levels previously unknown in modern history. Nearly every day, I hear a story about people whose family members haven't spoken to them since November 5th. You may have seen a few of the tales on the news about couples who voted differently getting divorced. What has happened? How has American politics become this cancerous for our families? That one supposedly unshakable institution ordained by God for unity and formed with love. You may be feeling a bit of tension yourself on this subject. And it might have grown in recent days. Let me paint a picture for you. You tell me if this feels familiar. Beautiful faces sit around a giant ornate table. A giant roasted turkey makes its landing in the center. Mashed potatoes and stuffing crowd the edges. Everyone is drooling. And then... Someone mentions how the turkey costs a lot more this year than it did last year. <laughs> or how it's going to cost more next year. Yes, Thanksgiving is nearly here. And all of its associated stressors have come along for the ride. 
Holidays can be difficult, especially when families don't agree on sensitive issues. That's why the conventional wisdom has always been to avoid politics and religion at the Thanksgiving table, and that may be sage advice. However, in our increasingly polarized world, I'm not sure that it's so simple. The tension of family gatherings, or really gathering with anyone outside of our political bubble these days, seems no longer to be simmering, but getting pretty close to boiling over. We've likely all faced such complicated situations since election day, and we'll probably all face some more this week. Truth be told, politics aside, Thanksgiving can be a difficult holiday for all sorts of reasons. No matter what it might be for you, we could likely all benefit from a refresher as to what this holiday is really all about. And so, for just a few moments, I'd like to put aside the mac and cheese and focus on the real centerpiece of every Thanksgiving. It's articulated very eloquently by Solomon in Psalm 127, our text for this morning. Let me share the first two verses with you. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat for God gives rest to his loved ones. Now we know Solomon in the Bible as that famous recipient of wisdom. And it's on full display here as he speaks to us about architecture? At least that's kind of what it sounds like and it would make sense, it would track with Solomon. He knew a lot about construction. He built the ornate, beautiful temple of the Lord in Jerusalem as well as his own gorgeous palace. But most of us don't have engineering degrees. We're not constructing houses. What does this text have to do with us? Well, especially this week, everything. These verses might sound familiar to you in part because they are echoed by Jesus a little while later. In Matthew 7, he employs similar imagery saying, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Even the most skilled builders can put all of their efforts into constructing a building, but unless it rests on a solid foundation, it is doomed to collapse. Likewise, our lives exist on the foundation upon which we build them. Either God's strong, solid word or the sands of this world and its pleasures and divisions. Paul accentuates this point further in 1 Corinthians by writing that no one can lay a foundation other than that which is already laid, which is Christ Jesus. And so, as with most things in the Old Testament, it's Jesus' words that truly crystallize our psalm's meaning. Solomon's building advice isn't about towers, but about hearts. He's not talking about building a house so much as he's talking about building a home. Anyone can attempt to construct a family or a marriage or a life but without God as its foundation, it is doomed to crumble. But again, what does this mean for us? Well, I think a lot. And so, as your holiday preparations are in full stride, 
I'd like to talk turkey with you about Thanksgiving and wonder what it might mean to invite God to be the centerpiece of your family, your relationships, and your life. Of course, the entire purpose of Thanksgiving, from its founding moment to present day, is to celebrate God's blessings. I recognize that such a cheerful attitude can be difficult to find, especially if this Thanksgiving holds difficulty for you. Perhaps this is your family's first Thanksgiving without an important member. Or maybe you can't make it home to be with your family on Thursday. The stress of traveling or setting the perfect table could be bearing down on you. Well, even, and perhaps especially in these realities, the true meaning of Thanksgiving is even more essential to celebrate. Our God is the great reconciler. As a result of Jesus' sacrifice, we can be reunited around his incredible banquet table one day. If we're feeling loss or stress during this Thanksgiving, we can look forward to a feast of blessings. The book of Luke tells the story of this banquet where God invites his people to join him for the feast, and yet everyone makes excuses. The story serves both as a caution not to reject God's invitation, as well as a celebration that God's table seats everyone. Whatever hurt you may be feeling today, or whatever seats are empty at your table, know that there is a place for you at his. However, the Thanksgiving table that I'd like to zone in on the most this morning is the one of disunity, the one with a family that struggles to find common ground. If that's you, first, know that you are not alone. In fact, in this message, the Thanksgiving table is microcosmic for the polarization that we are all encountering in the world today. So if yours is a family that is free of conflict, consider this message for the other areas in which you encounter those with whom you disagree. Whether it's with family or on the pickleball court, we have each experienced it. There was a survey done after the last presidential election in 2020 in which one in five U.S. adults said that a close personal relationship of theirs was destroyed as a result. Imagine that number after this election. And to be clear, Thanksgiving and worldly tension isn't just about the election. It's about all kinds of issues that cause us to be divided. What do we do? Well, first, as with so many things, we turn to Scripture. We can be confident that family tension is not a new thing. Cain and Abel didn't exactly have the best relationship. You might remember Jacob and the story of something about dressing up as his brother to trick their blind father into giving him his brother's birthright. Speaking of Jacob, can you imagine what Thanksgiving might have been like at his house? You know, especially when Joseph showed up in his Technicolor dream coat after his brothers had sold him into slavery? Awkward, to say the least. Oh, and by the way, all of those stories of family drama are just from the first book of the Bible. As Ecclesiastes emphasizes, nothing is new under the sun. My friends, make no mistake. God chose for these stories to be included in Scripture, in part to make sure we understand that family conflict is natural and common but also to provide us a source of hope and a path forward. Joseph is actually an excellent example. His brothers showed great remorse for their actions, and noting this, Joseph welcomed them. He even told them not to be upset about what they'd done, because God had used it to accomplish his will, namely, setting into motion the chain of events that would lead to his people 
being gathered in one place and freed to enter the promised land years later. The author and preacher John Piper likes to say, God may be doing 10,000 things in your life right now, but you're only aware of three of them. The tension that you may be experiencing might just be God's way of opening a door for even greater reconciliation and even stronger relationships in the future. This was certainly true of Joseph and his siblings. They wept together and lived as one family. In reality, their thanksgiving would have been joyous because they'd resolved their dispute by placing and cementing God as their foundation and trusting in his plan. We can look beyond scripture for examples of this too. The first Thanksgiving was forged by an unlikely friendship between the pilgrims and the Native Americans, two groups of people with vastly different cultures, and I'm guessing different political feelings as well. And yet, they united in Plymouth to give thanks to God for rain after a drought. They found a sense of community in their collective need, a need to be supplied by a loving, generous God. I recognize that in light of your own circumstances, any unity of such biblical or historical proportions may seem like wishful thinking. But the truth is, God's call to unity isn't just an idea, it's his divine plan and yearning. Psalm 133 speaks of how joyous it is when God's people live together in unity. Jesus brings the most unlikely outcasts to his table. Unity is the province of heaven. If you think about it, the entire Bible is one big invitation to God's party of community in which we all dwell together in peace and harmony. But still, recognizing the difficulty of accomplishing this in our own circumstances, may I suggest a few options to live into this Thursday and each day after. Number one, practice prayer. Have you been praying for those who you will see at Thanksgiving? Or really, all of those who you disagree with that you encounter out in the world? Or have you already written them off as lost causes? Is your attitude that I just need to make it through the week or just need to make it through this interaction? Or have you considered what it might mean to commit your circumstances to God? I know this might be difficult. Carson, you don't know my family, you might be thinking. And you're right, I don't know your family, but I do know our family. God. Throughout scripture, we are encouraged to pray for those we disagree with, including our government and those who persecute us. When tensions rise, do you rely on your own anger and frustration to solve it? Or do you pray for God's perfect peace? I am not a fan of going to the dentist. Every time that I sit in that chair, I find my fists clenching up, tensing as the pressure increases. And then every few minutes, I check myself, think of God's presence, and release it. Is that what God is calling you to do when you encounter those you disagree with? That brings us to our second thought, to show grace, humility, and kindness. In his book, Father Greg quotes the writer George Saunders by saying, kindness is the only non-delusional response to everything. When encountering people that he might otherwise disagree with, kindness is always Jesus' chosen path, and it should be ours too. In scripture, we are given the duty of mending relationships with neighbors, friends, colleagues, and family members. Yes, especially including those who voted differently than we did. Paul once wrote to Titus, remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers, 
They must always be obedient, always ready to do what is good. They should not slander anyone and must avoid quarreling. Instead, they should be gentle and show true humility to everyone. Later in that same chapter, he wrote that people who perpetuate division are condemned by that very sin. Whether our candidate won or lost, God invites us to humility and grace. And my friends, this is critical. Because truth be told, there may be no human act more attuned to unity than loving and wrapping your arms of faith and charity around people you can't stand. Or people who you maybe just can't stand in the moment. And sometimes... That means just listening to their opinion and offering them your love and a hand of healing. Boyle's idea that we're all unshakably good might seem to conflict with the reality that we are all sinners, but actually, I think it's reinforced by it. A commitment to unity means making the choice to care for everyone, even when they're hard to love, and in spite of their past behavior, and choose to offer them a hand of forgiveness while believing that God offers the same. In Proverbs 18, Solomon, the same author of our text from this morning, writes, Fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinions. Pretty on the nose in our culture today, isn't it? Wouldn't standing together and loving those with whom we disagree be the ultimate expression of kindness and the ultimate rejection of Satan's attempts to divide us, sometimes that even means reaching out to someone who you haven't talked to in a while and letting go of the anger in your heart to make way for God's kindness to rush through. I know that in this moment, Many of us are thinking of someone and thinking they're the ones who should be reaching out to me. But that's not really how it works with God. Oftentimes the greatest act of humility and faith that we can take is stepping out onto the gap of a cliff, knowing that God will bridge it. If not today, then one day. Which actually brings us to our third idea. Trust in God's timing. When we stop seeking to find common ground and unite with those whom we disagree, we are allowing human divisions to interrupt a divine plan. Boyle writes that God's dream come true is for there to be no more us and them, but rather just us. A large, vibrant, diverse family of faith gathered around a banquet table for a Thanksgiving feast with God as the centerpiece. And if you're struggling to believe that God can unite your family or your neighborhood or your pickleball court, consider what Malachi says. In his book, the last one in the Old Testament, God says, try me, put me to the test. Give me what you've got, and I will give you indescribable blessings. We may not have the power to restore families, to create unity, to engineer community, but God does. However, we have to ask him to do it. Are you? Solomon's lesser-noticed second verse in Psalm 127 reminds us that placing God at the center of our lives and families and communities doesn't just sound good, we actually have to do it. In verse 2, he says that it is useless for us to labor without trusting what God will do. Our efforts are so much more than mere words. It's one thing, for example, for a country to write, in God we trust, on its money, But unless it actually practices that trust, we are laboring in vain. Or, I suppose, we could just ignore all of this. We could dig our heels in deeper and lock ourselves into division and discord. 
We could shun everyone, including family members who voted differently than us. We could lock ourselves into a bubble with only those who affirm our views. We could allow our conflict to define us. Some have even wondered whether we should just draw a line in the sand with those with whom we disagree. Okay, but if so, what do we do? Do we cancel Thanksgiving altogether? Just put one less turkey on the table? I don't think so. I think God is calling us to unity. And that begins with our foundation. The central elements to making a Thanksgiving or a life successful are not the candied yams or the mashed potatoes, delightful though they may surely be. This holiday gets its very breath by inviting God into our homes and laying the foundation of his love. He is our centerpiece, our cornucopia from which our abundance flows. Have we forgotten that? Or has it been overshadowed by grievances that, though surely very trying, pale in comparison to heavenly matters? And by the way, if your family is one in which everyone gets along great, you're not off the hook either. You have a role to play in this too. How might you still invite God into your home and provide a safe and warm and welcoming space for those who might not be so fortunate, who might not be experiencing God's peace within their families? Who might you see around your table this Thanksgiving? A few weeks ago, a man I know sent an email to about two dozen guys, most of whom didn't know each other, inviting us to a barbecue at his house. No agenda, he said, just community. That is kinship. An invitation to be the family of God together. Because if Thanksgiving really is a celebration of God, maybe we should lay his word as its foundation. Because here's two things that we all know to be true. Number one, without God, there is quite literally no thanksgiving. And number two, scripture tells us that God calls us to unity. Therefore, if we are going to allow earthly things like politics and family issues to divide us, we might as well take God out of thanksgiving altogether. And if we do that, we might as well just cancel it. Maybe I'm the turkey for believing that politics is something worth kicking people out of my life or substituting my judgment for God's since God desires all of us to be together. Have I allowed the devil's wedge of disunity to disrupt God's great plan or to rob me of a critical evangelism opportunity? Well, today is the day that that comes to an end, at least for me. I am choosing to trust that God can take the most divided family, the most split nation, the most sinful world, and create a community of kinship with him as our centerpiece and foundation. I'm not giving up on Thanksgiving because I'm not giving up on our God. I don't know if you saw this in the news, but last week, the sound of silence was broken. Art Garfunkel, the musician of 1960s fame, shared that he has recently reunited with Paul Simon, the other half of their revolutionary duo. Garfunkel shared that the two were in tears as they reconnected after nearly a decade without speaking to each other. Unbeknownst to Art, their feud was fueled by some petty comments he'd made to a magazine about Simon in 2013. According to Art, they've not only patched things up, but might have a concert or two to play down the line. If you think about it, so many bands have split over grievances throughout the years. Imagine the amazing music of which our world has been deprived as a result. Well. Call me cliche, but in my eyes, 
The only thing more beautiful than music is love. Imagine all of the love we've been unable to share. All of the cards we've been unable to send. All of the messages we've been unable to exchange as a result of worldly disagreements. As a result of our shunning God's call to unity. With a sorry heart, Garfunkel said to the magazine, I was a fool. Well, maybe I have been too for waving my white flag to division and discord. But today, I'm renewing my commitment to trust God's plan and to do everything I can to fight for unity among his people. And I'd like to ask you to join me. There's a popular expression that goes, it's like turkeys voting for Thanksgiving. Basically, it means choosing to do something that is clearly against your own self-interest. Choosing to walk in to a tense Thanksgiving dinner or into a divided neighborhood gathering or send a text to a friend who voted differently than you might feel like you're doing that. But in God's eyes, our efforts to draw each other into community are beautiful and might just be our closest mirror of what heaven will look like. After all, a holiday based completely on the idea of God's people together gathered around a table singing his praises, that's kind of the blueprint for heaven. Thanksgiving is special because it can be the ultimate expression of belonging and compassion this side of eternity, if we will allow it to be. The final verses of Psalm 127 speak about how children are a gift from God. Family isn't always easy, but it's worth it. The best, most holy things always are. Remember, everyone is unshakably good, no exceptions, and we belong to each other, no exceptions. How can you work for God's unity and peace? How can you place him as the foundation of your family, your relationships, and your life? How can you make him the centerpiece of your heart and declare that in your home, he will be your cause for celebration? And then maybe, just maybe, for each one person who is willing and brave enough to answer those questions there will be one less turkey in our world. Would you pray with me? Dear God, as we come to this place, we know that you have called us to unity. It's one of those things that we see in the Bible a lot and sort of understand what it means, but it's one of those things that can be really difficult to live into being. Lord, we know that Jesus has set the perfect model of what it means to be united together in your holy name. May we follow that blueprint today and every day thereafter, even on the days and holidays when it can be the most difficult. In your beautiful, loving, abundant name we pray, amen.